Hi class, Dr. Jim here. So you made it through unit one and we're now on to unit two. So you're probably wondering why did we move back to chapter two after we went through and did chapter one, four, five, and six. Well, there's a method to my madness. The reason why I put chapter two in unit two is because chapter two talks about chemistry and biomolecules. And we're gonna see this come up again and again in this unit, talking about in chapter seven, when we talk about nutrients and how bacteria grow and do those things. And then in chapter eight, when we talk about metabolism and uh, cellular respiration and things like this. And so I think it's really important. And then also even in chapter nine, when we talk a little bit about DNA and that stuff. So all these things kind of play together. And that's why I kind of move chapter two with the other, this, the second unit and skip it out of the first set, which is more of an introductory uh, type of thing. So what are we talking about in chapter two? Chapter two is dealing with chemistry. In chemistry, again, a lot of you may have taken chemistry, maybe you haven't taken chemistry, but you probably have heard enough of this here that this should hopefully be a good review for you. We're gonna be going through and talking about, again, the atoms, the elements, and things like this. We're gonna be looking at pH, and then finally talking about the biomolecules. And again, this makes a really important chapter because it builds on everything that we're gonna be talking about in chapter seven, eight, and nine. So again, if you haven't had a lot of chemistry, I don't want you to be scared or anything like that because we're going to be going through this. And again, I think this will be a good review for those that have already had it. And really, you'll get something out of it if you've never had a, an ounce of chemistry before. And so we'll look at these things and kind of go through and figure out what's going on with these things. OK, so we're on to chemistry. So let's talk about the different types of chemistry and what we're going to be looking at today. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is what are atoms, elements, and the three kinds of bonds. So we'll be talking about the three types. We have covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrogen bonds. So we'll look at all those. We'll then talk about what is the pH scale and what is it measure. And so there is a reason for the pH scale today. If you haven't heard this before, pH scale means power of hydrogen. So I've given you a little bit of what it is and that, and what it basically is measuring is how acidic something is versus how some how basic something is, okay? And so we'll look at these different things and how that kind of stacks up. And then finally, we'll get into the organic molecules. And so organic molecules are basically molecules that have both carbon and hydrogen in them. And again, we'll talk about the four main types, which include your carbohydrates, your lipids, your proteins, and your nucleic acids. And so these are all the important things for nutrition and things like this. So we'll look at these things as well, okay? So that's what we're going into today and kind of looking at these things. And like I said, if you haven't had chemistry before, this will be something new, but I don't think it will be overwhelming. And if you've had chemistry before, this will be a really good review and you can kind of fast forward if you, if you get bored with what I'm talking about here and there and you've had a lot of it already. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so the first thing is, is matter. And matter is all things that occupy space and have mass. And so matter is composed of atoms. And again, here's our typical atoms that we have, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. An atom is the simplest form of matter, not divisible by simpler substances. And then finally, again, in the atom, you have the three parts. You have the protons, which have the positive charge. You have the neutrons, which have the neutral charge. And finally, the electrons, which have the negative charge. And again, here's our models of the atoms. Typically, you'll see in the nucleus, you'll have the proton and neutron in the nucleus. Okay, in the hydrogen, you only have the proton, no new, a new neutron. Okay. Again, in the carbon atom, you have six protons, six neutrons, but you don't always have the same number of neutrons, and so we'll get to that in a little bit, where neutrons can fluctuate how many they have. And then the number of electrons is always the same. So if you have six protons, you're always going to have six electrons. And the electrons are found outside the nucleus. Now, we're not talking about the same nucleus that you see in a cell. There's no membranes or anything here that we're talking about. But the nucleus is the center of the atom. The electrons are found in what we call either shells or a lot of times we call orbits or orbitals on the outside of the nucleus. And these guys spin around thinking like the moon spins around the earth. Okay, and that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today, how that is. Okay, so that's the basic structure. All right, and then all atoms share the same fundamental structure. Again, the how they are found and that stuff in an element is a pure substance. And so the characteristic number of protons and neutrons and electrons and they have predictable chemical behaviors. And so we arrange these things on these, di on these different charts. Here's the chart just showing you the major elements of life. And we'll come back to this uh, later on in chapter seven. 
But what I wanted to get to is the periodic table. And so probably many of you have seen this before. You may have even used this before if you've taken chemistry. And again, this just represents where the atoms line up in the periodic table. So you can kind of see you have a couple of different sets of numbers. On the top, you have the group numbers. And on the side, you have the period numbers. And these just refer to how they stack up on the periodic table. And so when you're talking about the groups, these groups behave very similarly. Okay, and so we're going to be talking about these things as we go along. So when we talk about ionic bonds, a lot of times you're going to see us talking either about sodium, magnesium, potassium, or sometimes calcium and that stuff. And these guys like to donate electrons, okay, because they have an extra electron they just want to get rid of. These guys over here on the other side like to accept electrons, okay, so these fluorines, chlorines, bromines, and iodines all like to accept electrons. And so a lot of times you'll see these guys with these guys forming ionic bonds. And so that's going to be important when we talk about donating versus accepting electrons. Now there are also some other things that are interesting about the periodic table. So these guys in the light blue here, these are the noble gases. And that means that they're basically these gases that are inert. They don't react with anything. They'll never bond with anything. And that is because they have the right number of electrons in their shells. And so we'll talk a little bit about that here in a couple minutes about what are shells and how do you fill them and how do you do that. But it's very important with bonding and things like this. Another thing that's interesting is here, these silver colored ones or gray colored are metals. A lot of times you see these associated. So we have aluminum or tin or um, in some of these other ones, you have some of these different ones. This is cesium in that. And so you have these different uh, elements that are in the metal category. And then some of these over here, these are gases, these green ones, and then they're light green or olive green. And then you have these, which are more solid. So obviously carbon, phosphorus, these are more solid elements. And again, depending on where they sit in the chart and the color, you kind of talk about how these guys react and interact with one another. On the very bottom here, you can see that we're up to 118. And just recently, they've actually named the last four. So now I can change these guys, the U's, these double U's and that stuff. They represent how many electrons or how many uh, protons are there. They're now been named as a regular name. And so now we're up to 118. And so you can go Google that if you want and find out what the last three or four names are for these elements and what they're called. Okay, so that just kind of gives you an idea of where these things sit on the table. And so we call these elements because they all have similar behaviors or behaviors and they all have the same numbers. Okay, so the atomic number represents the number of protons. So if we go back to the periodic table, you can see there's these numbers on top. That represents how many protons are in each element. And so again, they're fit on this table so that you know exactly how many protons they have. And so you can look at barium for or boron, for example, and know that it has five protons or carbon. It has six, nitrogen has seven, oxygen has eight. And you don't have to be a major scientist to understand this. This number represents how many protons are there, okay? We also have what is called the mass number. Now the mass number is typically on the bottom of, the, of each box and it is typically a decimal and that tells you how many protons and neutrons are there. Now normally you would assume that, oh, okay, if I know that there's eight protons in there, there's gonna be eight neutrons and so the atomic number should be 16. And that makes a lot of sense. If you look at oxygen, you look at nitrogen, a lot of times that's what you're gonna see, that whole number. Oxygen is eight, air is 16. Nitrogen is 14 for the atomic mass, and so you can kind of put those together. And so typically you see that, but not always do you see a whole number like that. A lot of times what you're going to see are decimals, and that is because a lot of times what happens is neutrons become a space filler. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about when you get a box. So we, you know, not too long ago celebrated Christmas and a lot of you guys get boxes from Amazon and that stuff. And you have these things that fill the space so that your thing that you buy from Amazon, whatever you want to buy, doesn't get broken. And so the neutrons are kind of one of those things that keep the atom from being broken and the protons interacting with the electrons. And so they're kind of what are we call a space filler. And so a lot of times the number of protons and number of neutrons are equal. But we have these situations where elements have neutrons that ha or have uh, no more neutrons than normal. Take, for example, carbon. 
Carbon normally has six protons okay, and six neutrons. But there's elements out there of carbon-13 where it has six protons and seven neutrons, and carbon-14 that has six protons and eight neutrons. Okay. Now, why is this important? Well, you probably have heard of something called carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 dating is looking at how many atoms in, a, in an object have carbon-14 atoms. Okay. And so they can actually judge how old something is based on how many carbon-14 atoms there are present in a, sol or a substance. Okay, so the younger something is, the more carbon-14 atoms you're going to have. Carbon-14 degrades over time to carbon-13 and then finally carbon-12 in a period of about 2,000 years. And so every 2,000 years, you lose a carbon-14 atom. And so you can judge some, how old something is, is based on how many carbon-14 atoms you have. So if you have a lot of carbon-14 atoms, you know that you're going to have something that's relatively been there for a short amount of time. If you have something that has doesn't have any carbon-14 atoms, you know that this thing is very, very old because it, all the carbon-14 atoms have degraded out of it, and now it's all carbon-12. It's just an interesting take on what an isotope is. Now, you probably have heard something called radioactivity. Now, radioactivity like uranium or plutonium are radioactive because they have more neutrons than normal and again what happens in these situations is when they lose neutrons they give off energy and we utilize that energy in the form of nuclear energy okay and so what we do is we get that energy heats up water the steam turns the turbine and then powers your house and so typically what we think about is that there are some atoms that will take a very long time to degrade and there are some that degrade very quickly like uranium or plutonium which degrade very quickly and so when they degrade they release energy, and that energy is radioactive, we call it, because it gives off a lot of nasty energy, and we can utilize that to power things, but it also can be very deadly if we get too close to it. And that's for another day and another time. Okay, but that gives you an example of what an isotope is. Okay, we talk about the atomic weight. The atomic weight is all the masses put together. So when we talk about the number of protons and neutrons for the mass, but we have to average all the mass numbers together, and that definitely is the decimal. And so that's typically what you see on the periodic table. And I'll show you an example of it here in just a minute. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about these electron orbitals in just a minute. This is how many electrons are in those shells on the outside. So you can see here in the carbon atom, you have two electrons really close to the, or to the nucleus, and then you have four more outside that that shell and so we'll talk about the shells here and that's going to be really important for bonding so we'll talk about that in just a minute okay so we look at the periodic table again you can see here's the atomic number atomic number tells you how many protons and again these are arranged in how many uh, protons they have then if you look at the bottom a lot of times you see the mass and like i said the mass is going to be given in a decimal because that is taking account of all the protons, all the neutrons, and all the isotopes that are out there, and so you take the average of that. And so you can see some don't have any isotopes, where you have nitrogen, which is a nice even 14, and oxygen, which is a nice even 16, but you get something like chlorine, which is 17, so you'd assume that the mass would be 34. However, that's normally not the case. You see it at 35. So there's a lot of isotopes for chlorine that are not, that also have 18 and 19 neutrons that are in there and so that's why you see the mass so large in chlorine okay just kind of giving you an idea of where you see these things and where they sit all right all right so if two atoms have the same number of protons and electrons but different number of neutrons they are called what different elements isotopes of an element ions or orbitals i'll give you a second to answer that if you said isotopes, you are correct. So good job. So we just got done talking about isotopes. Isotopes are equal number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So the protons are not going to change. If you change the proton, you change the element. So when you change the neutron, that's when you have the isotopes that are associated with those things. So good job if you got it right. All right, so let's talk a little bit about electron orbitals. And this is going to play a huge role with bonding here in just a minute. Okay, so I talked about that there's these things called shells, and these are the orbits on the outside. And in these shells, the atoms like to fill these guys up. And so once they're full, they can move on to the next shell. So once you have two electrons in this first shell, you move on to the second shell and you fill it up 
And once you get to eight, you move on to the next one. And again, if you have eight or 18, you fill that one up and you move on and so on and so forth. And so we do this and that is describing what we call the octet rule. Okay, and the octet rule is basically that elements will bond together with other elements so that they have they both have eight electrons in the outer shell to make it stable. So a noble gas, you remember when I was talking about the noble gas, those blue, light blue gases on the outside, and I said they're inert, they don't react with anything. Well, all those elements have eight electrons in their outside shell. And those eight electrons are not going to allow you to bond anything. So their shells are full. They're not going to react anything, so that's why they're called noble gases. Most all other elements, or all other, other elements other than noble gases, are either missing one electron or have one extra or two or three extra electrons, so they want to get rid of those guys. And so when that happens, they want to bind with something that will fill their shell, so that they either, if they have only three electrons in their outer shell, they want to find something that will bind and fill five more electrons, so it fills up to eight. Likewise, if you have seven electrons, you're going to try and find something with one electron so you can bind with so you get to eight. So think of eight as the filling number. So that's why it's called the octet rule. So I have a couple of different examples here. Oxygen has six electrons in the outside shell. It will bind with two hydrogens to fill the shell. Now they share these two electrons. And so now you can see oxygen has its eight electrons and hydrogen will want to fill it up to two so now it has its two electrons it can share so that's one example another one here's hydrochloric acid chlorine has seven electrons it wants one more electron it can share so it binds with hydrogen and again now you have eight electrons in the chlorine and two electrons here and so that's the property of binding and so we look at how many electrons they have in order to bind and so that's going to be an important thing when we talk about these bonds okay so when we talk about bonds and molecules we have a molecule and this is a chemical substance that results from a combination of two or more atoms okay so we're either talking same atoms or different atoms so like when we were talking about hydrochloric acid you had the hydrogen and the chlorine that is a molecule okay now you also have compounds, which molecules are combinations of two or more different elements. And so this is again, when you talk about it. So this can be interchanged a lot of times. So I interchange molecule and compound quite a bit, but really the big difference between molecule and compound, molecule represents those that can be put together. So you can have two oxygen atoms together and that's a molecule, okay? Or two hydrogen uh, atoms together and that's a molecule. Whereas a compound is always going to be at least two different molecules or two different atoms. And see here I go and using it. So saying like hydrochloric acid, you have a hydrogen and you have a chlorine. They go together. That would be a compound. So typically I always use molecule because it's just easier to talk about. It's easier to say because it kind of encompasses both. And so you can use compound, but when you're talking about compounds, you have to remember that it's two different atoms. And so that's the difference and people get confused. So just, just keep it easy and call it a molecule. Okay. We have the formula or mass weight. And again, this is all the atomic masses of all the atoms put together. And so if you're doing some hardcore chemistry, a lot of times you have to figure out what the mass weight is. And if you're making solutions and things like that, we won't be doing that in here. But if you take chemistry, a lot of times you have to figure out what is how many grams you have to add to get to a mole and that stuff. And you're going to use the atomic mass to figure that out. And so that's basically the sum of all the masses that you have in that case. Okay, chemical bonds, again, when two more atoms either share, donate, or accept electrons and form molecules. And so again, we'll talk about the different types of bonds here in just a minute. And again, there are the three types, the covalent, the ionic, and hydrogen. And so we'll take a quick brief view at what these different things are. Okay, so let's look at the covalent bonds. So when I think of covalent, I think of sharing. These guys share their electrons. They play nice with one another and say, hey, you need two electrons. I'll give you, I'll share with you my two electrons. And so now we'll both have eight. So kind of think of it that way. These guys are gonna share to make really strong bonds. When you share, you make really nice strong bonds. And so these are gonna be the strongest of all the bonds here. And most molecules are gonna be covalently bonded together. Okay, so when we think of molecules, two atoms coming together, they're going to share their electrons and be covalently bonded. Okay, we have actually two types. We have the nonpolar, which is the most typical. This is the equal sharing. Everyone plays nice. And we have what is called the polar. 
Now the polar is an unequal sharing of electrons and what happens there is that one atom is kind of the bigger bully and says, you know, I know you're sharing with me, but I really like it a little bit more than you need it. And so they kind of pull it closer to them. And so a lot of times we see that where you start to generate a charge because it pulls more of the electrons closer to it. And so it makes the atom itself a little bit more negative. Whereas on the outside, when you pull those electrons away, it makes this end a little more positive. And so we'll talk a little bit about that with water here in just a minute. So here's some different covalent bonds. Again, you have two hydrogen atoms. They both have one. They'd like to have two. So they share their two electrons and they form a nice single bond. Here's molecular oxygen. Again, they have six and six. So what they do is they share their two with one another and they form a nice uh, covalent bond. Okay. And then carbon. Carbon has, again, uh, four electrons in its outer shell and it would like to fill them. So a lot of times you see you get the one hydrogen. So again, one hydrogen for each one. So now carbon has eight and hydrogen has its two. And so now they're nice and happy. Everything is solid and it's not going to fall apart. And so that's how we form these covalent bonds. Think of filling up the shells or that octet rule. Now I talked about polarity. Now what happens is, is sometimes the atoms are kind of more of a bully and they kind of pull the electrons away. Okay. And so they want it more than these guys. So these hydrogens. So what happens is, is the electrons are more negatively charged. And so when they pull more elect electro electrical charge towards them or electronegativity, they're going to become more negative. Where these guys are going to be, again, the electrons are being closer to the oxygen, and so this side becomes more positive. And so we typically see this with water, and we call this a polar molecule. Think of a polar magnet. We have a positive side and a negative side, okay? And so this is going to be important. When you have ever played with a polar magnet before, you know if you put the plus and the plus together, they repel from one another. But if you put a plus and a minus together, they attract. This is the opposites attract theory. And so this is going to be really important, especially when we start talking about hydrogen bonds. So I'll come back to this in a little bit about hydrogen bonds. So remember the positive and negative. This is going to play a huge role with some bonding here in a little bit. Okay, but that's polarity. Now the second type of bond is ionic bond. And so now in this situation, we're not talking about sharing, but we're talking about donating and accepting. So if you remember when I was talking about the sodiums and the magnesiums, they like to, they always have an extra one that they want to get rid of. And the chlorines and the fluorines and those guys, they always have a space that they want to take one from someone. And so these guys play really good partners because these guys over here, the chlorines, and, or I'm sorry, the, the sodiums and the magnesiums always want to donate one. They're like, I want to get rid of this thing right away. Whereas the chlorines, hey, I'm very happy to take it from you. So why don't I take it from you, get it off your hands and give it to me. And now we're both happy. And that's what happens with the ionic bond. So you have ones that become positively charged and then you have ones that are negatively charged. Because again, if you remove electron, you're going to become more positive. And if you gain an electron, you're going to become more negative. And again, that's the amount of electrons you have. When you lose that, the center part is going to be more positive. And here you gain an electron, you're going to be more negative. And so that's where the cation, cation stands for positive, anion stands for negative. Okay. And again, the typical solution we see is with sodium chloride. Now here's the example. Here's sodium. Sodium has 11 protons and 11, and 11 electrons. Okay. So it has this extra electron out in the shell. It really liked to drop this electron because then it would be nice and happy and have eight, elect or eight electrons out here. And here is chlorine, where again, it has seven electrons out here, but it really liked to take one from someone because it would make it more stable if it could have eight. So what sodium does is it takes this electron and says, here, take this electron. I don't want it. You can have it. And so sodium says, or chlorine says, thank you. I'll take it. And now they're both filled. And so because of that, though, you lose... You, you gain positive charge here and you gain negative charge here. And that's what happens in these situations. And so when that happens, they form a bond and you can see they form these crystal structures. And so that's typically what you see with these crystals. Okay. Now what happens when you throw salt into water? Salt, and, salt dissolves in the water. And why is that? Because what happens is the water molecules will break apart these ionic bonds. And so that's what actually happens to the salt is that the salt dissolves and breaks the atoms into individual sodium and chlorine molecules in the water itself. 
And so that's what happens with the salt. Now, if you if you let that water sit in the in the open air and let it and let it evaporate off, what happens is the chlorine and salt sodium find each other again and start to form big crystals. And this is a way that you can actually grow crystals. So if you've ever tried this at home, or if you want to do a really cool experiment at home, just dump a bunch of table salt into a glass and put some water in it, hot water, and then just let it evaporate over time. And what you're gonna find is that you can actually grow crystals. You will make these very large salt crystals based on this type of principle. Okay, and that's due to ionic bonding. So think of crystals, when you think of crystals, think of ionic bonds. All right, now the third type of bond is the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is a very weak bond. So when we're rating bonds, we're talking about covalent being the strongest, ionic kind of in the middle, and hydrogen the weakest. And the reason for that is these are very, very weak associations. And this has to deal with the positive negative charges. So you remember when we I told you that this molecule kind of pulls, the this atom pulls the electron away and you generate a positive charge? Well, that positive charge will bind to a negative charge on another molecule. It's like that polar magnet again. You have the positive and negative. Two positives will repel each other. A positive and negative will attract and, and attract one another. And so this is the opposites attract. In this situation, oops, in this situation, this is what happens where the positive and negative attract one another and you form this very weak bond. Now, the reason why we talk about hydrogen bonds is because they're very important in biology. We see it with proteins and protein structure, what we'll talk about in a few minutes, and then also in nucleic acids, a very important bond between the base pairs. And so they form this really nice, strong structure to make that ladder. And when you open and close DNA, you form those hydrogen bonds to keep the base pairs together. And again, we'll talk more about that in Chapter 9, why that's important. But that's where you're going to see it in biology. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are very weak, but there's a reason for those. And then again, it's due to the association of the positive and negative charge between them. So don't get, get this confused with ionic. This is a just with the polar molecules here. All right, so molecules where atoms share electrons contain what kind of bonds? Covalent bonds, ionic bonds, or hydrogen bonds? If you're paying any attention, you'll get this right. Which one was it? If you said A, it's covalent bonds, you got a star. So there you go, covalent bonds share, ionic bonds accept and donate, and hydrogen bonds are those weak interactions between the positive and negative charges of the different molecules. Okay, and so that's how you associate those different bonds. Okay, I'm gonna skip the oxidation reduction reactions because this is something that we talk a little bit about in, um, in chemistry and that stuff but it just gets people confused. It's all about donating and accepting electrons again, reducing and oxidizing. And I'm not gonna really spend any time on this. I put it in here just for you guys to see it, but again, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you on a test or anything, but just be aware, sometimes you hear about oxidation reductions. And again, reductions mean you gain electrons, oxidation means you lose electrons. And so again, I don't really talk about it that often, so we'll leave it at that. All right, so let's talk about some chemical shorthand. And so, again, we're going to look at this when we talk about enzymes here in the next couple weeks. And so reactants and products. Reactants are always going to be on your left-hand side. Your products are always going to be on your right-hand side. So if you look at this reaction here, these are your reactants. This is your product, okay? Like here, here's your reactants, here's your products. And then in this case, reactants, products. So real easy way to remember this. Those things that are on the left are always your reactants. These things on the right of the arrow are always your products, okay? Now we talk about different types of reactions. Synthesis means to put together. So you can see here you have two different reactants that get put together into one product. So you know when it's a synthesis is when you have two reactants, one product, okay? A decomposition is just the opposite. When you have one reactant and two products, and so you can look at the number of these things and so synthesis synthesis and decomposition or uh, a lot of times you see, might see it decompose or something some other degradation these different types of words mean all the same things where you get basically two or more products an exchange is where you exchange the atoms you really don't change the number of reactants or the products and again we see this occasionally especially when we're talking about acids and bases and that stuff but typically when we're in biology we're either going to be talking about synthesis or decomposition or reduction. So we'll look at these different things again uh, later on when we talk about uh, nutrients and, and things like this. 
okay, and enzymes. All right, so another thing is solution. A solution is your solutes and your solvents mixed together. And so a solution is the mixture of one or more substances. So in this case, you have the water and you have the salt. That is your solution, salt water. The solutes are what get dissolved. Okay, so the solutes in this case are going to be your salt, your sodium and chloride. So that's your solutes. And the solvent is what does the, salt, the dissolving. And so you always remember that. The water is typically your, always your solvent because that does dissolving. It causes the atoms to break apart. Okay, in this case, this is what's happening here. The molecules, I shouldn't say atoms, but the molecules break apart. All right, and then aqueous versus non-aqueous. And again, we'll look at this with membranes. When you're talking about hydrophilic, these are the ones that like water and they dissolve in water. Hydrophobic means they hate water and they repel. So think of hydrophobic as your salts and sugars and things like this, carbohydrates, a lot of different things, proteins a lot of times. Hydrophobic are oils. These things don't dissolve, and so they hate the water. They want to stay away, and so they repel the water. They get away, and so that's what happens. There are some molecules that have both properties, and we call that ampathetic. Think of ambidextrous or ampathetic in this case. You have, use both hands and that stuff, and this is the same thing with ampathetic, meaning it has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties, and this is very typical of our proteins. Our proteins have parts that are hydrophilic and those that are hydrophobic, and that helps them fold because the hydrophobic are going to stay away from the water, so they get tucked inside. The hydrophilic are going to be in the outside when they get exposed to water, and that's 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 typically what we see in those structures. So think of empathetic with proteins and that stuff. All right, so the next thing is the pH scale, and I talked a little bit about this at the beginning of our lecture and said, what is the pH scale? pH actually stands for the power of hydrogen. And so what you're measuring here is how many hydrogens are in your solution. When we talk about something that is very acidic, it has lots of hydrogens, okay? So we say this H plus, so it has lots of hydrogens. So something like hydrochloric acid is gonna have lots of H's or lots of hydrogens. Something on the other end of the scale, like potassium hydroxide, is not going to have a lot of hydrogens. And so this is going to be very weak with the hydrogens. And so what we're looking at is the concentration of hydrogens. How many hydrogens, how many of these guys do you have? And so that's what pH stands for, power of hydrogen. Okay, power of hydrogen. How many of these guys do you have in your solution? Okay, and so we can measure these based on how many hydrogens they have versus how few hydrogens they have. Okay, and we get to seven we're neutral, we have an equal number of hydrogens and these OHs. So one thing to note on the scale is in you're in acidic, you have more hydrogens as you go this way in the scale. When you go from seven, you have more of these OHs in this range, okay? And so we'll look at this and figure out how these things go. But this is typically the scale that we use. And again, it measures how many hydrogens are present in the solution. Okay, we can look at the pH scale and look at it in different things. Hydrochloric acid is going to be very acidic. Lemons are very acidic. And you know when these when things are very acidic because they're sour or very bitter. Okay, they have a, a sour taste to them. A lot of times you eat these things and it tends to give you either heartburn or it can give you a painful stomach because of the acid that's associated with them. Okay. As you work your way up the scale to neutral, that turns into water. And then as you work your way down this way or up this way to 14, again, these are guys that have more OHs, less Hs. And so these, again, are going to be very caustic to your skin as well. And you're going to see a lot of these things associated with soap and dissolving because they are a very good job of dissolving organic organic substances. And again, sodium hydroxide is the strongest base that we know. Hydrochloric acid is one of the strongest acids that we know, okay? And so that's where the pH scale is. Now, another thing to remember with the scale is the scale is out of base 10. So as you move from 1 to 2, you're actually going by a power of 10. It's not just 1 minus 2 or 1. It's actually a power of 10. So when you go from 1 to 2, that's 10. 2 to 3, that's 10. 3 to 4, that's 10. So what does that mean if I go from 1 to 3? Well, I go from 10 times 10, so if I go from one to three, that's 100, okay? Go to one to four, that's 1,000. If I go from one to five, that's 10,000, okay? Now, this can get really tricky if you try and do the math, and I know a lot of you guys are afraid of math and that stuff, and I try and make this class as non-math needed as possible. So let's think of an easy way to figure out how 
more or less or how strong or how weak something is when we compare something. Let's say we're going to compare something like a pH of 4 versus a pH of 8. Now you could sit there and go, okay, I know a pH of 4 to 5 is 10, 5 to 6 is 10, 6 to 7 is 10, and 7 to 8 is 10. And so I have four tens, and it'd be 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which would give you 10,000. Okay, but I've got a much easier way to figure this out so you don't even have to do the math and multiply or anything else. Let's take our two numbers. So again, I said four versus eight. Okay, eight minus four is four. Okay, take a one and add four zeros to it. 10,000. Easy trick, works every time. Let's compare six versus 10. Okay, again, 10 minus six is four. Four zeros, add the one, 10,000. How about something, let's say five versus 13, okay? 13 minus five is eight, put one and eight zeros, and you know what it is. It's now 10 million in this case, okay? And so you can keep doing that very easily without even knowing, and that's comparing the strength of something. And so it's always the smaller number compared to the larger number. So if we're saying how strong, let's say, a pH of two versus a pH of six is, we say that a pH of 2 is going to be, so if we use our number, is 4. So again, 1 with 4 zeros is 10,000 times stronger than a pH of 6. Now you could say a pH of 6 is 10,000 times weaker than a pH of 2, but let's just keep it easy and always say this is going to be the stronger end and this is going to be the weaker end. Okay? And we look at it like that. So you can talk about those things like that. And that's typically what I really want you to know about the pH scale. pH measures how many H's or how many H pluses you have versus how many OH's you have on this side of the scale. Okay? And again, this shows you the numbers, and again, it works every time. And so you can figure out, you can see as you go down the logarithm, logarithm, that's a nice long word, you can see the number of H's gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you count this out, it's 10 to the minus 14, if you know scientific notation. Likewise, if you did OHs, this number would be very, very small. And as you work your way down this way, it gets very large. And so it's basically the inverse of what you see here. And so, and that's how you know the pH. But the pH is measuring how many H's you have. So the numbers represent these numbers, even though they're getting bigger, means that the number of H's is getting less and less and less. Okay, so always remember that. All right, so let's compare the two solutions. If the solution A has a pH of 2, and the solution B has a pH of 4, which of the following is true? Is it A has 2 times more, B has 2 times more, A has 10 times more, B has 10 times more, or solution A has 100 times more than solution B? So I'll let you think about that for a second, and remember my uh, subtraction rule, okay, and see if you can do it. I'll give you a minute. All right, let's think about that. So if we take our subtraction rule and say two or four minus two is two, add my one and add the two zeros, that's 100. So the correct answer is E in this case. Now you could do it very easily and say, okay, I know two to three is 10 and three to four is 10, 10 times 10 is 100. But again, that confuses people because you gotta do math. This is really easy, you subtract four from two. I can subtract four from two in my head still. That's two, I know I add two zeros behind the one, voila, 100. Get the answer right every time. So do that method, tell you'll never fail on that. All right, let's talk about the chemistry of carbon or an organic compounds. And so now we're gonna talk about the four biomolecules in this case, and we're getting closer to the end. Okay, so organic chemicals. Organic chemicals are compounds that contain both carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so when you have carbon and hydrogen, this is an organic chemical. So think of this, something like carbon or carbon dioxide, that's not organic. Water is not organic. You need something with carbon and you need something with hydrogen. Okay, so something like methane, carbon and hydrogen is organic. And so when they send these little probes up to Mars, one of the things they're looking for is methane because methane shows organic Organic means life, and so that's what they're looking for. So that's one of the things. And so always remember when we're talking about organic, even though we talk about water and oxygen, all those things, those aren't organic. What is organic is having carbon and hydrogen together in a molecule. So you need carbon and hydrogen, okay? So that is it. Why do we need carbon? Well, carbon is the fundamental element of life and it, for atoms in its outer orbital. Again, so it has, it's like the perfect Lego. 
binds to anything and you can form single, double, and triple bonds and you can form linear branch and ring molecules. And I'll show you here an example of how that looks here in just a second. Okay, so voila, here are your molecules. So like I said, you can form single, double, and triple bonds with, with the carbon molecule. So it's basically, like I said, that perfect Lego. When you form carbon, you can form linear uh, pieces, you can form branches, and you can form ring molecules. So carbon is a very wonderful piece of Lego in the piece of life, okay, or in the structure of life, because it will fit together with any molecule and it fits very well because of the way it bonds. And so that's why carbon is very important. All right, so also important are the accessory molecules that bind to the organic compounds. And again, these are accessories. These are what we always call, what are we call the R groups. And so the, a lot of times you see these as accessories on the side or side chains, and these are gonna be really important. And again, they give reactive properties with the whole molecule. And again, we're going to see these again, so don't be a worry. Don't worry. Don't scramble trying to copy all these down. We're going to see these again, especially when we talk about amino and the phosphate and some of these other uh, molecules. Okay, so don't worry about writing all this down. We'll see it again. But it gives it a function for the organic compound. All right. So the macromolecules. These are biochemicals, are organic compounds by living things. So remember... Why we look for organic molecules? Because organic molecules are made by living things. Okay, and so macromolecules are large compounds assembled from smaller subunits. So we always talk about a monomer, which is a simple unit, and the polymer, which is a chain of monomers. Okay, and the four macromolecules are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And so again, carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So think of your daily nutrition. A lot of you guys maybe start a diet for New Year's so you could lose some weight that stuff and a lot of times limiting your carbohydrates and your fats it's going to be part of it and again think about what you need to survive on these are your macromolecules okay all right and so here's a chart of all these different things and again we'll look at these in more general topics here but this just gives you an idea of the four carbohydrates the lipids the proteins and nucleic acids and we'll briefly go through all these things real quick hopefully this is a review for you all right so here are the carbohydrates Again, carbohydrates stand for the hydrate of carbon or water with carbon. So you can always see carbon with the water, and that's typically how the molecule is situated. And again, we have these different molecules. Typically for carbohydrates, it's the number of C's or equal to number of O's with the double number of hydrogens. Okay, and so we can talk about glucose, galactose, and fructose. They all have the same molecular structure, but they are, I'm sorry, not the same molecular structure, molecular number. So they all have six carbons, okay, six, 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 but their structures are a little bit different. And so based on their structures, we call these isomers. And so again, glucose, galactose, and fructose, all six carbon sugars, they're just a little bit different where their carbons are at and how they're arranged and because the molecules are slightly different, okay? And so it gives different properties and things like this. All right, so we know the saccharide. The saccharide is a simple. We call this the monosaccharide, and anywhere from three to six carbons are in there. Monosaccharide is the simple monomer. Okay, the disaccharide is putting two monomers together. So example of monosaccharide would be glucose, okay, galactose or fructose. Disaccharide would be sucrose, okay, that's glucose and, um, what is it, sucrose and fructose together. That's sucrose, okay, that's your table sugar. Or if you have, or I'm sorry, glucose, yeah, I said glucose and fructose. Or you can say lactose, which is basically galactose and glucose put together. Or you have maltose, which is two glucose molecules put together. And so you can look at a lot of different things that way. Down here is a polysaccharide where you have lots and lots of glucose molecules put together. This is an example is starch. Starch is a very common one that we talk about. Chitin is another one, glycogen. These are different types of polysaccharides. And again, these are gonna be five or more monosaccharides put together. So actually really three or more in this case, and we call that a polysaccharide. So again, saccharide is simple sugar, and then you have mono, di, and poly, based on how many molecules you have. Okay, how we link them together, they're linked together by glycosidic bonds. And again, we talk about dehydration synthesis. So think of the uh, reaction again, synthesis. You have two reactants, one product. Here are two glucose molecules. You synthesize that together. Here are the reactants. Here's one product. You have maltose. Same with sucrose. You have glucose and fructose. 
two reactants, one product. And finally, galactose and glucose, put those together and you make lactose. And so again, two reactants, one product. That's dehydration. And what happens when that when you put these together, you lose water. And so when you take water out, that's dehydration. That's why it's called a dehydration synthesis because you're pulling water out to link these things together. So you see that extra molecule of water. So synthesis, because you're putting two reactants into one product and water is also removed. You dehydrate, you remove water. So we call that dehydration synthesis. Now, again, what do carbohydrates do? They uh, function in cell structure, adhesion, and metabolism. So we see them in a lot of different things. We'll see them in structures. So we'll talk about these things in the walls of bacteria. Okay, we talked about the um, peptidoglycan and that stuff. The glycan part is the sugar. We see it as an adhesion for the glycocalyx, things sticking, and then also metabolism. We talked about glucose and cell respiration. So we'll see this again and again and again as we go along. Okay. Next one is the lipids. And again, the lipids are hydrophobic. Again, oils versus waters, they don't mix because these guys are nonpolar molecules. Typically, we have functions including energy storage, phospholipids, which are the major cell membrane component, and steroids, which are also another cell membrane. So think of membranes when you think of lipids. But lipids are also important for hormones and other things that we that we discuss that we're not going to discuss that much in micro but again play your role but typically when we think of lipids we think of membranes and that okay one interesting thing is when we talk about saturated versus unsaturated and a lot of people have confusion about which ones am i supposed to eat which ones are good for you which ones are not good for you and that so here's a really easy example to remember so think of these acids as train cars. And let's say you're going to take the train to Chicago tonight. You're going to go and have a good time in Chicago and you want to take the train down to Chicago so you don't have to drive back or anything. But when you get on the train, it's rush hour and all the seats are full. You have one choice at a spot and you cannot move. And that is an example of a saturated uh, fatty acid. So when you're talking about saturated, saturated means all the carbon is full. There are no empty seats. You can't move. This makes a very solid fat, okay? When it's solid, it means it's solid at room temperature. And these are bad for you because if they're solid at room temperature, they're going to be solid in your blood vessels. And so these things stick to things. They clog things. It's just like putting grease down your drain. When the grease solidifies after it cools down, it becomes solid, and then it clogs your drains. The same thing happens to you. So saturated fats, even though they taste really good, because things like butter and lard and things like this, bacon grease, all good and yummy things that we mix into our food are also bad for us. So saturated fats can be really bad for us as well. A non-saturated fat, as you see, has empty seats. And so it allows you to be flexible, allows you to move. Those flexibility gives the oil flexibility and liquid. And so we call unsaturated fats really good for you because they stay liquid at room temperature. And so these are the good ones. These are the ones these fats are found in nuts, in fish, in vegetables, and things like this. And so we encourage people to eat fat, but we want you to eat unsaturated fat because they stay liquid. They're not going to clog you. And so these are the good fats. So when we talk about omega omega-3s and omega-6s and things like this. The omega-3s are the fish oils. We really want to eat those because those are good fats. They're unsaturated and they allow us to move and be flexible and things like this without risk of clogging. So think about that. Train cars and think about the difference between a saturated versus an unsaturated fat. Here's a phospholipid. Again, we'll talk more about the phospholipids in chapter uh, 7 and 8 with the membranes and moving things through. But think of the phospholipid. The phospholipid has a phosphate group. This is going to be the water liking part or the hydrophilic part. This is going to be the hydrophobic part. So the phosphate is always going to be towards the water. These are going to be inside. And so you have the phospholipid in this case where the water is on either side. The phosphates are towards the water where the tails are in the inside protected from the water. And so again, forming these things. And that's important. And again, we'll look at this with the membranes in chapter seven. All right. And then also the cholesterol. Cholesterol is important because it gives some stability in the, uh, in the phospholipid uh, bilayer. And again, we'll talk more about membranes, but cholesterol is important. Okay. They say cholesterol, we need good cholesterol. And so the HDL, and that is because we need it in our, in our membranes as well to keep them stable. And so you need some cholesterol in your diet as well. All right. So
Triglycerides that have double bonds in their fatty acid are best described as what? Saturated, unsaturated, phospholipids, or cholesterol. So we talked about that. Think of the train cars. If you said B, you are correct. Unsaturated, double bonds give you flexibility. That flexibility means liquid, liquid at room temperature, and that's the important thing. So if you said unsaturated, you are correct. So good job. All right, the next thing is proteins. Again, this is the most predominant molecule in our cells. There are 20 amino acids, which are the monomers, and then those build proteins. And so, and these are put together to make by peptide bonds. And those peptide bonds form between each individual amino acid, and those amino acids make the proteins. And so, again, they fold in very specific 3D shapes. And again, the functions and support, enzymes, transport, defense, and movement. We're going to talk about proteins a lot through the semester. So again, protein is very important. It's that amino acid structure. Okay. Again, the amino acids are monomers that make up the polymer. And if we look at amino acids, whether you're talking about in microbiology and bacteria versus humans, they're the same. And so you want to talk about evolution. We can look at this and say that evolution must be happening because bacteria use the same amino acids as humans do and it hasn't changed over a long period of time and so we all use the same monomers to build our proteins and so i think that's an important part in when we think about evolution in this case okay again amino acids are attached through peptide bonds to form proteins and so you can see here here's the bond forming in between we remove the water monomer monomer okay so you have a monomer and a monomer these are two amino acids this is a synthesis two are actually three reactants and then one product and you can see each time you form a bond you remove water this is known as a dehydration synthesis again so think of it this way it's just drawn on the other way but here's your reactants here's your products you have three reactants one product dehydration you're taking water out and a synthesis okay so again, forming a peptide bond through dehydration synthesis, just like in the carbohydrates, lipids do the same thing and nucleic acids all do the same thing. All right, one of the important things is to knowing your protein structure. And I think the easiest way for us to describe this is let me find a piece of paper here in my office. And so I kind of do this here. So this is a piece of paper, okay? And this represents the protein or the protein or the amino acids. So let's think of protein structure like you would for making a paper airplane, okay? The primary structure is the paper, okay? How the paper is. Now, you could have a primary structure where it's white paper. You could have blue paper, pink paper, orange paper. That's the primary structure. That is the sequence of amino acids. So just think of it as what does the paper look like? Okay, and that's the primary structure. In this case, this is something that, you know, it's just a piece of paper from my desk. Okay, secondary structures are how these guys start to fold, the individual fold. So if I start to fold my paper like this, this is all secondary structure. Okay, so this is a fold. Okay, so that's one type of fold. This is another fold here. This is secondary structure. Okay, here's another fold here. Okay, another structure in this case. Okay, so now I've got my two folds, my three folds. Okay, and then I open it up and I fold it again. That's another fold. That's a secondary fold. Okay, and another fold like so. That's another fold like so. And then I can fold it down one more time. Okay, and all these are secondary because they're all different types of folds that I'm making. Okay, and so then I fold it one more time here and see if I can do this. Do, 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 do. Okay, and once I have the full structure made, so I made this paper airplane, it's not the best paper airplane in the world, I've made better in the past, but you can see this is not perfect by any means, and you can see all my, my folds are pretty bad, but you can see that this structure here is a tertiary structure. This is all the folds put together to form a paper airplane, so you can say my tertiary structure is pretty poor in that case but it's based on the secondary structure if i made my folds better in my secondary structure my tertiary structure would look better so think of it that way so your paper airplane your primary structure is the paper the secondary structure is all the folds that you do and the tertiary structure is what the final product looks like now there's also something called the quaternary structure and the quaternary structure refers to when you have multiple 
paper airplanes put together to make one giant airplane. So let's think about this. If you were a child of the 80s or maybe you like the movies and that stuff, think of the Transformers. Now they have some of those robots that will actually put robots together and form a bigger robot. Okay, That's kind of your quaternary structure. We have individual robots, which are your tertiary structure, and those tertiary structures get put together to make one giant robot. Okay, And when they mix the one giant robot to fight everything, that is the quaternary structure. And so the example we use for quaternary structure is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made up of four individual subunits of proteins that are tertiary structure. Those four subunits have to come together just right to make hemoglobin, which then gives you the power of your blood cell to carry oxygen throughout your body. And so quaternary structure is subunits coming together. So think of robots or hemoglobin, however you wanna think about it, putting those things together. So primary is your paper. Secondary is your folds, tertiary is your final product, and quaternary is when you're putting lots of those paper airplanes together to form maybe an armada or whatever, and they all fit together into one giant airplane. Okay? So think of it that way. That's quaternary structure. All right, and then the last thing is the nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. We're going to talk more about this in Chapter 9 and that stuff, and we have a nucleotide. A nucleotide consists of a phosphate, a sugar and a base, okay? And so that's the basic structure of the nucleotide. We have DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. And again, the bases are A, T, C, and G. And then again, you see the bases. It forms a double helix and it functions in hereditary material. It stores or the blueprint of what to make in the cells. You can see these dashes here. Here's your hydrogen bonds. If you remember back to the beginning of this lecture, we talked about hydrogen bonds. Very important for nucleic acids to stick the DNA together. They form these hydrogen bonds between the two base pairs. Again, these are weak bonds, but they hold DNA together. And we're going to show, I'm going to show you this again in chapter 9 and 10, why this is important, because this will be kind of cool when we can manipulate DNA and that stuff. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. The difference between DNA and RNA, one of the differences is the sugar. In DNA, it's deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, it's ribonucleic acid. The other difference is, is that you have a U instead of a T in RNA. And another thing that you see is the structure. DNA is always a double helix. RNA is always a single structure, no helix in this case. It's linear and single. And so that's another one. Typically, we'll see RNA associated with protein synthesis. And so in Chapter 9, we're going to spend a lot of time discussing what protein synthesis is going through the the pathway of protein synthesis, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's where RNA is going to be important. DNA, think of as the blueprint, the master print or the master copy to tell you what your cells are going to look like, okay? And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. RNA is the kind of the go-between the DNA and the final product of the protein. All right, and then again, we talked about the DNA nucleotides, the sugars are deoxyribose. Here's deoxyribose versus ribose, which is found in RNA. And then the nucleotides, A, G, T, and C in DNA. And then the only difference is instead of T is U in RNA. And really the only difference in between uracil and thymine is this methane group. And this is more structurally stable. That's why you see it in DNA and not in RNA. And so this gets into the chemical properties of RNA versus DNA. RNA is less stable. RNA tends to fall apart really easily where DNA is pretty rock solid. And you've seen this, if you can talk about forensics and things like this, DNA can be left at a crime scene where RNA, you really have a hard time. If you look at it funny, it falls apart on you and that stuff. And that's due to the nature of the molecule of RNA. Okay. And so again, we'll talk more about this when we get into chapter nine. All right. And then the double helix of DNA, forms two long polynucleotide strands formed by the hydrogen bonds. And again, we'll talk more about this in chapter nine. Here's the double helix, the ladder, and the backbone. The backbone is the phosphate and the sugar, and then the base pairs make the rungs of the ladder. And then passing the message on, again, it gets copied. Replication copies the DNA. And then you can see making the new strands. We call this, um, uh, I totally for blanked on here. So we call this uh, <laughs> semi-conservative replication. Sorry about that. Semi-conservative replication where, again, you have the two old strands and you make one new, one old strand. So the old is the blue, the red is the new, and you can see that's how you replicate DNA. And so we'll talk again more about this when we get into Chapter 9 and what happens in that case. Okay.
The last thing, and I promise we're done, is ATP. We're going to be discussing ATP in Chapter 8, so it's important to know. ATP is very similar to the A nucleotide in DNA. So again, you have your sugar, you have, or I'm sorry, you have your sugar, you have your A, a base, here's your nitrogen base, that's adenine, here's your sugar, here's um, deoxy uh, ribose, okay? And then instead of just having one phosphate, you actually have two phosphates in this case. And so the two phosphates in this association is where the energy is stored. This bond right here is very important. So when you're talking about ATP, ATP is the molecule to store energy. ADP is the molecule that's basically showing you used energy. And so ATP is necessary to uh, use to run cellular products and that stuff. And we're going to talk about how we generate ATP and cellular respiration, why that's important. But you're going to see again and again that this molecule, this ATP, ADP or ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, the three phosphates on the adenine sugar uh, nitrogen base, the A base. Okay. And so again, we'll talk about this in chapter eight. And this is again, needed. This is the energy currency of the cell. All right. So what is the true, what is true about RNA? It's double stranded, contains deoxyribose. It contains nitrogenous base uracil, holds the genetic information, or is it all true? I'll give you a second. Okay. Hopefully you didn't fall for it's all above is true because the answer is C, the nitrogenous base is uracil. So again, RNA only has, it has ribose, it is single stranded, and it doesn't hold the genetic information. That's all DNA. The only one that pertains to RNA is the uracil, the nitrogenous base uracil in this case. So if you got that one right, good job to you. Congratulations. All right, so let's summarize and finish it up here. So we talked a little bit about atoms, and again, atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You have the same number of protons as electrons, positive, negative charge, neutrons are the space fillers, okay, and they have no charge. We talked about the three types of bonds, covalent, ionic, and hydrogen. Covalent is sharing, ionic is donating and accepting, and hydrogen is those charges, the positive and negative charge of the two molecules, and they form a weak bond. Again, it's a range strongest to weakest, okay? pH scale measures the power of hydrogen or how many hydrogen are there. So we're talking about the measure of the concentration of hydrogen. The more hydrogen is closer to zero, okay? The less it's closer to 14 and it's the logarithmic scale. So remember, as you are talking about it, each step, one, two, three, four, is a step of 10, okay? And that you can decide if you go from one, let's say one to three, that's not going to be just a difference of two, but it's actually 10 times 10 or 100. And remember, use that subtraction rule. If I take a molecule, a pH of five versus a pH of eight, eight minus five is three. I know I can add three zeros and I know five is a thousand times stronger than eight. Use it every time. It works perfect. Okay. And then we talked about the four organic molecules. Hopefully this is brief enough for you, the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Again, I'm not gonna ask a lot of questions about those things because I think you guys have probably been hit over the head enough times, probably either biology or a &P with these things. But again, just knowing what a carbohydrate is, what a lipid is, what a protein is, and nucleic acids. I really like to ask questions about the structure of protein. So understand the four structures, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Okay, know the difference between RNA and DNA. That will be on the test. I can guarantee you that. Uh, carbohydrates, know you know what a monosaccharide, disaccharide, polysaccharide is, and then lipids, know the difference between saturated versus unsaturated. And I think that's a fair question. Other than that, that's all I've got for you today. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send me an email. Stop by my office hours. Ask me after class. Uh, you'll feel free to do that. I'll be happy to go over and explain those things with you again if, if there's more explanation that needs to be made. And I thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.